If you're looking for laboratory testing that will allow you to dive deeper into the biochemistry of your athletic patients, then this presentation is for you. Join me as we go beyond conventional laboratory testing to assess the metabolic blockages, the nutrient deficiencies, the gastrointestinal dysfunction, and the hormone imbalances that could be preventing your athletic patients from reaching their full health and performance potential. The biomarkers and pathways of interest that we'll be looking at are innovative yet validated, and they can be assessed with currently available and cost-effective laboratory testing from Genova Diagnostics. Welcome everyone. My name is Dr. Warren Brown. I work in the medical affairs department at Genova Diagnostics, where I am part of a team of physicians that provides educational support to clinicians of all kinds including medical staff from numerous professional sports teams and Olympic teams around the world. I'm also the naturopathic physician for Clinical Advances for Sport, where for more than a decade I have developed and refined a structured clinical program that helps athletes to perform at their best, and I utilize Genova Laboratory Testing to help achieve that. We will begin by discussing how specialty laboratory testing allows us to dive deeper into the athlete's biochemistry and how it helps us to construct a more personalized, precision approach to their health. We'll then briefly look at differences between specialty laboratory and conventional laboratory testing. Then the bulk of the presentation will focus on the specialty biomarkers and pathways of interest for the athlete. That part of the presentation will draw upon recent developments in published studies in sports science, as well as some of my own experience in working closely with athletes. Let's get started by looking at why specialty laboratory testing is such a great tool to utilize in the athletic patient, and how it helps in developing a more personalized precision approach to their care. Around 70 years ago, Dr. Roger Williams coined the term biochemical individuality to help explain the differences that people have in susceptibility to disease, responses to drugs, and differences in nutrient needs. Dr. Williams was a brilliant researcher and made several significant contributions to science, including discovering some of the B vitamins and lipoic acid. This concept of biochemical individuality was significant because it placed a spotlight on the differences in metabolic patterns among healthy people. His work was groundbreaking and advanced even further by the likes of Dr. Linus Pauling, Dr. Jeff Bland, and many others in orthomolecular and functional medicine. So in addition to those genetic variabilities that Dr. Williams was describing, we also know there are epigenetic factors things in our diet, things in our lifestyle, things in our environment that can influence our biochemistry and can create some significant differences from one athlete to another. At the opposite end of the spectrum from biochemical individuality, we have the guidelines and position statements that are published by sports committees and sanctioning organizations, and we also are seeing this kind of thing in sports medicine textbooks. And here's typically what we're finding. An overemphasis on macronutrients, mostly carbohydrates and protein. An avoidance strategy around fats, even the essential fatty acids. Recommendations for specific products like chocolate milk. Of course, that's going to be loaded with sugar or high fructose corn syrup. Making recommendations based on body weight only, not accounting for the type of athlete or the type of sport. Ultimately, these resources have limited value due to their one-size-fits-all approach. There's little room for biochemical individuality, and a significant percentage of the information is debatable. Of course, many athletes and healthcare providers are not paying a great deal of attention to the dietary guidelines, even at the highest levels of competition. They're realizing the limited value of the guidelines, and they're looking for more answers. Frequently, athletes end up turning to supplements. A recent study found 41% of college athletes are using at least one dietary supplement. For advice about which supplements to take, athletes are often completely on their own, since most conventionally trained healthcare providers 
and team medical staff aren't fully educated on the proper use of dietary supplements. This leaves athletes looking to the internet, social media, podcasts, teammates, etc. for guidance, which isn't ideal. Another method that a lot of athletes use is the take-everything approach, which is at best inefficient, at worst it's counterproductive or even a little risky. I always say whenever possible, it's best to make decisions about biochemistry based on biochemistry. Now let's take a look at some of the differences between conventional laboratory testing and the testing offered by Genova Diagnostics, the original innovator in the functional medicine specialty laboratory testing space. What I mean by conventional laboratory testing is the type of tests that we usually get in the primary care setting. They're a little more routine and a little more disease oriented. They're usually performed by a general laboratory or a laboratory that's part of a hospital system. Conventional laboratory testing is important. So the CBC, chem panel, iron panel, etc. All of my athletes are getting those and they're getting Genova testing in addition to it. So with that said, let's take a look at some of the different information we get from each type of test. Conventional lab testing is often an important part of identifying pathology, making a diagnosis. We still need to know if someone is anemic, has poor blood sugar control, problems with liver, kidneys, thyroid, etc. And it's a good way to do that. It's also important for monitoring disease activity. But while conventional lab testing is good in those areas, it typically lacks the granularity we need to identify functional imbalances, which is a strength of specialty laboratory testing. With specialty laboratory testing, large collections of biomarkers are arranged in panels, providing a systems-oriented approach. This is done with cutting-edge, innovative biomarkers with good scientific rigor behind them, and the best tests will incorporate some algorithms and AI tools to help with interpretation. There are circumstances where conventional lab testing offers a health-oriented biomarker, vitamin B12, for example. However, its clinical value is very limited. A serum vitamin B12 is okay for identifying severe deficiencies of B12, but it's not good at detecting functional imbalances. Even some prominent conventional medicine groups in the U.S. are starting to agree that normal levels of serum B12 don't necessarily rule out B12 deficiency in the cells or in the tissues. There are better markers for identifying patients who need more vitamin B12. Methylmalonic acid, for example, is an organic acid that's produced in high amounts when vitamin B12 levels are low inside the cells. This makes it an excellent functional marker of vitamin B12 status. We know this through knowledge of the biochemical pathway that produces methylmalonic acid, but also through a robust amount of recently published research on it. With respect to other nutrients, a case can still be made to measure some things directly. For example, we can make decisions about fatty acid status by measuring it directly in the blood. On the left, we see a suboptimal DHA level, which can be addressed through diet or through supplementation, and we'll see improvement in follow-up testing. Functional indicators of nutrient need involve this pathway analysis that we see here on the right, where metabolite A converts into metabolite B and then into metabolite C with the help of two enzymes. The second enzyme in that pathway having a nutrient cofactor where, if absent, could lead to a buildup of metabolite B. So there's value to direct measures, at least for specific markers, and functional indicators of nutrient need. The best tests will incorporate both approaches, which Genova has been doing all along. Here's a closer look at a functional and dysfunctional metabolic pathway. On the left, we see metabolite A converting to B converting to C with the help of enzyme 1 and 2 again, 
enzyme 2 has the nutrient that it needs, and therefore when we measure metabolite B, we see normal amounts. The dysfunctional metabolic pathway on the right features an accumulation of metabolite B, which is measurable in the urine, and that's because enzyme number 2 lacks the nutrient cofactor it needs to help convert B into C. Metabolites are the biochemical receipts for important body processes and systems. In some ways, we can think of them as showing us how the body has spent its metabolic money and which accounts are overdrawn. Many of Genova's tests and support materials are organized in pathway format to assist with results interpretation. This is metabolomics. It is a functional approach and we believe that this provides the deepest understanding of things like mitochondrial function, which is shown on the left here in Genova's NutriVal profile. Metabolomics is the large-scale study of small molecules called metabolites. The metabolome is a term used to describe these molecules and their interactions within a biological system. This field of study is rapidly expanding in published literature and is perfectly suited for use in athletes. To quote from this recently published review article, we foresee greater interest in the subarea of metabolomics in sports nutrition with an emphasis on using the results to design personalized precision nutrition and recovery strategies for maximizing the effects of exercise-induced health benefits. Now that we've explained a little bit about how and why Genova does things differently, let's take a look at the biomarkers and pathways that are important to assess in your athletes. In my own practice, I use these tests to help identify targets for performance enhancement, injury prevention, overall health, and longevity. We can't talk about anything related to muscle without mentioning the mitochondria, because they are, after all, the powerhouse of the cell. Although every living cell has mitochondria, muscle cells have the highest concentrations. And the most important job of the mitochondria is to make ATP, which is the energy currency of the cell. The citric acid cycle, which is central to mitochondrial function, can be assessed through urine organic acid testing. Organic acids are reported in the metabolomics and the NutriVal profiles from Genova. Because the nutrient requirements of the mitochondrial enzymes are well known, this method of assessment can help us to identify needs for important nutrient cofactors like the B vitamins, magnesium, manganese, glutathione, and CoQ10. So correcting a nutrient deficiency will help to alleviate metabolic blockages or inefficiencies related to energy production. As you will see through the rest of this presentation, I have included the names of the Genova tests profiles relevant for each slide at the bottom left of each slide. We all know the metabolic requirements of athletes are higher. Some elite athletes are burning thousands of calories more per day than a sedentary person. However, oftentimes they are only conscious of their macronutrient intake, mostly protein sometimes carbohydrates, less commonly fats. What some athletes are surprised about is that they also have greater micronutrient needs. Macronutrient utilization is somewhat dependent upon micronutrient status. This study mentions that exercise stresses metabolic pathways, which leads to increased needs specifically for the B vitamins. The screenshot at the bottom of this slide is from the metabolomics, which provides a summary of micronutrient needs, including the B vitamins. Organic acids also provide valuable insight into oxidative stress, a process in which cells and tissues can be damaged by free radicals. Some studies indicate that endurance athletes, ultramarathoners and marathoners, etc., have the potential to create overwhelming amounts of oxidative stress due to the massive ramp-up of oxidative phosphorylation. Symptoms of oxidative stress are nonspecific, 
So laboratory testing is the only clear indication of oxidative stress. Studies have also shown that the total antioxidant capacity, a protective mechanism against oxidative damage, tends to be lower in athletes than non-athletes because of the intense training. Lipid peroxides are evidence of oxidative damage to cell membranes. 8-OHDG is oxidative damage to DNA. When either are elevated, it could mean that the free radical burden is overly high or the antioxidant status is too low, although many times it's both. When finding evidence of oxidative damage, it's reasonable to think about supporting the athlete's antioxidant capacity through the diet or supplementation. However, we don't want to supplement blindly with antioxidants. Recommending them to an athlete who doesn't need them may attenuate some aspects of adaptations to training. This is a good example of the test-don't-guess mantra where we need to be strategic about the use of antioxidant supplements. Here we see the needs for alpha lipoic acid and glutathione summarized. These nutrients have been studied in the context of muscle damage, muscle fatigue, muscle recovery, and multiple other critical body processes. Glutathione levels in the body may be reduced for a variety of reasons other than intense exercise. Poor diet, toxic exposures, stress, even some medications that are commonly used by athletes. This study mentions that the use of anti-inflammatories may account for increases in both oxidative stress and mitochondrial dysfunction. We also know that oxidative stress increases substantially following surgical procedures, presumably due to increased immune vigilance. If we let oxidative stress gain the upper hand, the total antioxidant capacity will eventually become depleted, opening up more opportunities for tissue injury. Most athletes I've worked with over the years have been hyper-focused on protein. And yes, protein is very important because it's building blocks for growing and maintaining muscle. However, amino acids are also required for immune function, neurotransmitter synthesis, injury recovery and collagen formation, energy production, methylation and endogenous creatine production, and hormone production. In fact, they're involved in almost every single body function. Interestingly, not too many clinicians are actually checking amino acid levels, and identifying deficiencies can be really helpful and important for the athlete. If you'd like to dive deeper into amino acid analysis, the NutriVal and Metabolomics Support Guide is a great resource. The amino acid section starts on the 57th page. I've included a QR code here, which you could scan with your smartphone camera as a shortcut. Of course, it's also available at gdx.net. Many athletes know about the branch chain amino acids, isoleucine, leucine, and valine, and rightly so. They are directly involved in muscle building and recovery, as well as several other aspects of health. Branch chain amino acid supplements do have a place, and I have recommended them on occasion. However, look at the example on the right. A branch chain amino acid supplement wouldn't be unreasonable here since the levels of all three are low to borderline low. However, arginine, histidine, and taurine in this example are also in need of support. So a dietary change, some kind of protein digestive support, or an amino complex would probably make a little more sense here by providing broader amino acid coverage. There are some athletes that seem to be aware of the importance of collagen, mostly because of its involvement in joint health. Collagen is a structural component of connective tissue, muscle, bone, and skin. The amino acids glycine and proline are especially important in collagen formation, but there are also supportive roles played by threonine and lysine. 
Each of those can be measured. Correcting a deficiency could have significant impacts on injury recovery and prevention. While low levels of these amino acids could be a decision point for things like collagen protein supplements or bone broth, it would be important to interpret within the context of the rest of the amino acid profile. The effects of the essential and metabolic fatty acids are widespread in the body and utilized by many different body systems, making them important to the health and performance of the athlete. Here are some of their roles. Energy production, cell membrane structure and function, inflammation and immune modulation, cell signaling and gene expression, alpha-linolenic acid and omega-3, and linoleic acid and omega-6 are considered essential, meaning they cannot be synthesized by the body. They must be present in the diet. As we saw earlier, some athletes are under the impression that they should be avoiding dietary fats, which can lead to deficiencies and functional problems. The omega-3 fatty acids in particular have demonstrated effects in the health and performance of athletes. They are directly involved in muscle recovery because of their ability to modulate inflammatory responses, protection of the brain and cognitive function, especially DHA, improvement in cardiovascular risk profiles, thanks to the omega-3 index, and maintaining proper structural fluidity of cell membranes. We are seeing some promising research around the use of DHA an important omega-3 fatty acid in concussion management and prophylaxis, as well as cognitive performance. I'm not certain how or to what extent the research will evolve from here, but it is very exciting to see. We know DHA exhibits anti-inflammatory properties in the brain, and the brain is composed of approximately 60% lipid. No doubt that head trauma triggers a lot of inflammation. Perhaps the inflammation modulating effects of DHA are helping to protect the brain from some of that excessive inflammation that occurs with head trauma. Magnesium is required for more than 300 biochemical functions in the body. Oxygen uptake, energy production, and electrolyte balance are just a few of those functions that are dependent upon this important mineral. Some public health studies indicate that approximately half of Americans are not getting enough magnesium through their diet. To make things worse, it's one of the minerals that we lose when we sweat. Those participating in sports requiring weight control are especially vulnerable to deficiency, like boxing, wrestling, rowing, etc., since they often use sweating as a way to stay within a specific weight class. Research suggests that deficiency impairs exercise performance and amplifies the negative consequences of strenuous exercise. Zinc is a mineral that has been identified as having a role in muscle remodeling, modulation of exercise-induced stress, and immune function. Zinc is also an important structural component of the SOD1 enzyme which helps to protect cells against oxidative damage. In Genova's NutriVal profile, the plasma zinc level, as well as a functional analysis of amino acid metabolites known to be dependent upon zinc, help to provide an assessment of the athlete's need for zinc. Stool testing is an incredibly valuable tool for identifying functional gut problems. Some studies indicate that up to 70% of athletes have some degree of gastrointestinal dysfunction. And in my own practice, I see this a lot. Some athletes just dismissing their symptoms, while others have such poor function that it actually threatens to cut their careers short. Here are some of the reasons why gut health is so important. It's the primary site where food begins its conversion into energy. Approximately 70% of the entire immune system is found in the gut. 80% of neurotransmitters are produced in the gut. Some gut bacteria have the ability to synthesize important nutrients like amino acids, B vitamins, and even vitamin K. 
metabolites and enzymes that are produced by the gut bacteria have both local and systemic effects in some cases. Beta-glucuronidase is an example which plays a role in recirculating steroid hormones. So it's not hard to see why poor gut function could lead to poor performance. There are a wide variety of reasons why athletes can end up with gut problems. The reasons being reduced blood flow to the gut during physical exertion, mechanical forces applied to the gut, electrolyte imbalances, poor diet, overuse of anti-inflammatories, and even poor sleep patterns. This review article does a nice job of explaining what happens to the gut during high-intensity exercise. Blood flow is directed away from the gut to muscles, heart, and lungs, and it happens at the expense of blood flow to the gut. It can be problematic for high-intensity and endurance athletes. In this one aspect of gut barrier dysfunction, the absorptive surface of the small intestine can become compromised. Elevations in fecal secretory IgA, which is part of Genova's GIFX comprehensive stool test, can be elevated for a few different reasons, a common one being gut barrier dysfunction. In a 2019 study from the journal Nature Medicine, we have a description of the potential performance-enhancing benefits of Vilanella, an important member of the gut microbiome. This bacteria utilizes lactic acid as a fuel source, which may help to protect athletes from overly high lactic acid levels. As we know, lactic acid is a significant contributor to delayed onset muscle soreness. This discovery is consistent with the concept that a well-balanced gut microbiome is helpful for the modulation of both detrimental and beneficial metabolites. Lactobacillus and bifidobacterium are gut bacteria that have received a lot of attention in published studies. They are found in many fermented foods and probiotics. Their benefits in the gut include immunomodulatory properties, anti-inflammatory properties, short-chain fatty acid production, and vitamin synthesis. These two organisms are considered to be among some of the most important in the entire gut microbiome. Some studies have associated lactobacillus and bifidobacterium with a significant reduction in upper respiratory tract infections and symptoms in endurance athletes. Short-chain fatty acids are bacterial metabolites that are produced when bacteria in the gut microbiome ferment fiber or resistant starches. Short-chain fatty acids have demonstrated positive impacts on skeletal muscle function and gut barrier function. We're starting to see some studies describing prebiotics and probiotics as contributors to ergogenic potential because of their contributions to short-chain fatty acid production. There are trillions of bacteria living inside our gastrointestinal tract. That works out to approximately 2% of body mass, and they're producing metabolites 24-7. That's a remarkable amount of metabolic activity. Some sources estimate that the metabolic activity of the gut microbiota is so vast that it could rival that of the liver, one of the most metabolically active organs in the entire body. It's kind of like an auxiliary organ in that sense. So a well-balanced gut microbiome could be a significant contributor of beneficial metabolites that support both gut health and systemic health. The commensal bacteria section in the GIFX support guide is a great resource for more information on the gut microbiome, and I've included a QR code here as well. In the newest era of microbiome research, we are beginning to see more emphasis placed on assessment of the microbiome as a whole. New technologies such as whole genome sequencing and artificial intelligence allow us to see more than 95% of the microbiome. With this panoramic view of the microbiome, we're able to get a better sense of microbial stability and diversity. 
which some research indicates has associations with athletic performance. Numerous studies indicate that the balance of the gut microbiome is heavily impacted by diet, which can be used as a therapeutic tool to address microbiome imbalance. Just 10 to 20 years ago, most of the discussion around diet for the athlete was about what to feed the athlete. Now the discussion seems to be what to feed the athlete, but also what to feed the athlete's microbiome. There are many ways that an athlete's microbiome can become imbalanced. These two articles describe the effect of antibiotics on the gut microbiome, mentioning that there could be impacts on motivation, endurance, absorption, and nutrient synthesis. Antibiotics are sometimes necessary to treat infections. However, current consensus is that they are widely overused and that more caution should be exercised when considering prescribing antibiotics due to their antibiotic resistance, but also due to their impacts on the gut microbiome. Most athletes know that hormones have a huge impact on health and performance. However, while the anabolic hormones, testosterone and DHEA, receive a lot of attention in the athletic world, the catabolic hormone, cortisol, is frequently overlooked. Cortisol, being a wear and tear type of hormone, has opposing actions to testosterone and DHEA. Chronically elevated levels of cortisol will have a negative impact on the health and performance of the athlete. This study makes a case for monitoring anabolic and catabolic hormones in saliva to help design better training programs. An important advantage of salivary cortisol compared to blood cortisol is that it can be assessed throughout the day. That's important because cortisol levels vary greatly through the day. And as you can imagine, multiple blood draws over the course of a day is impractical for most people, especially athletes. Under ideal circumstances, cortisol levels should increase by about 50% or more at 30 minutes after waking up. This is the cortisol awakening response. Then, levels should decrease gradually through the day to a point within the reference ranges, being the lowest at night. Spikes during and shortly after exercise would be expected, but should be temporary. As you can see, a single point of morning cortisol in the blood would not provide the detail needed to detect problems with the cortisol awakening response or the diurnal cortisol rhythm. Let's take a look at some of the common symptoms of chronically high cortisol. That could be poor recovery from workouts, chronic pain, sleep problems, often resulting in fatigue, difficulty building and maintaining lean muscle mass, increased fat mass, cognitive issues like brain fog and mood issues. And you can see how these symptoms are often confused with those of low androgens. There is significant overlap. Improvements in these symptoms can be possible with simple tools. Lifestyle interventions like stress management practices and sleep hygiene, or natural products like adaptogens, phosphatidylserine, or L-theanine. Addressing cortisol and the HPA axis should always be addressed before manipulating testosterone. This is also the only compliant option for athletes competing in sanctioned sports where prescribing testosterone or DHEA is just not allowed. This was an interesting study on overtraining syndrome, which was defined as resulting from excessive training load without adequate recovery, leading to decreased performance and fatigue. They mentioned that the pathophysiology of OTS in athletes is not fully understood, which makes accurate diagnosis difficult. However, the study did show that the cortisol awakening response was flat for OTS-affected athletes, but functional for healthy athletes. As we've seen in this presentation, guidelines and guessing have limited value. Most of the time, they're just not individualized enough 
to help achieve performance optimization for every athlete. Conventional laboratory testing has a place and is useful, but functional testing helps us to identify functional imbalances, and that's using innovative and validated biomarkers. Lastly, while it's true that there are some common areas of dysfunction among athletes, there still remains a need for testing in order to really get your patient's biochemistry truly dialed in for performance. As you consider the information presented here, it's worth thinking about laboratory quality. It's something that Genova takes very seriously. We have seen a lot of specialty laboratories come and go over the years, many of which have failed because of quality issues. Everyone at Genova Diagnostics knows that you depend on test results to make clinical decisions about your patients and that validity, reproducibility, accuracy, and precision are key to maintaining your trust. Genova is licensed by CLIA at the federal level, as well as every state requiring it. Both internal and external proficiency testing is performed regularly. This commitment to quality has helped Genova to gain a reputation as a benchmark, even among other prominent laboratories. On behalf of Genova and myself, thank you for taking time to view this presentation. Please do connect with us. There are plenty of ways to reach us, and we always love hearing from you on the social platforms. Thanks again, everyone. Bye-bye.